Hi everyone, welcome to our Young Adult Service. My name is Kaya and I'm part of this growing community. Thank you so much for allowing us into your home. We've been on such an amazing journey just growing and getting to know God more. So today is a special one as we are starting a brand new series titled My Story in God's Story. We would also love to connect with you. So if you're here, do let us know via the comments. If you're watching on YouTube, click the link below the video. And if you're watching on our online service um, via our website, do let us know in the comments and also click the link there. This next song is an invitation for you to worship and to encounter Jesus right where you are. Be blessed. You're never changing God Forever stay Jesus, my Savior, your never-ending God. You are eternal, always are able, Jesus. Be my constant, be my anchor, don't let me walk. Don't let me wonder You are steadfast You are faithful Don't let me wonder Don't let me wonder
let me wander, God. Don't let me wander. Be my constant. Be my anchor. Don't let me wander. Don't let me wander. You are steadfast. You are faithful. Don't let me wander. Don't let me wander. Hi, everybody. Hello, hello. Good evening. Hi there. My name is Tepo Matli. I'm married to this lovely lady, uh, Musa. And I think um, this is just our story of how we actually got married. Um, as we were preparing for the wedding day, so we were meeting constantly just to go through the wedding list, making sure that you know the seating places are correct, making sure that uh, we have the right catering and whatever. Um, the president comes comes on and announces that due to you know the coronavirus and the restrictions that are taking place um, the number of people that will be attending whatever function has to be limited and so we were then left to scramble and to kind of change all the plans that we had um, you know before that and yeah there were quite a lot of costs involved that you know that that we had to bear that were sunk um, but I think throughout that whole experience, we were able to, you know, find peace in the fact that what we were doing is twofold. You know, we were inviting God um, as part of our journey for the rest of our lives into our marriage. And also it was, we were hoping for a reconciliation in our families, for, for both our respective families to, to, to have um, a reconciliation and joy in our family that in our families that would um, I guess heal whatever wounds had been there you know were prevailing because I mean as part of you know figuring out who's going to come to our wedding we needed to you know think about the relationships involved and the healing that needed to take place so we were constantly praying into that the wedding day was was great um, God showed up. Um, there was it was a it was a very joyous occasion, and you know, God's faithfulness showed up in the sense that there was a reconciliation in our families. There was joy in our families, like genuine joy in our friends and families, um, and it was a great day. It was a great day, and I think that kind of propelled us into our wedding, into our marriage. Um, because we've consistently seen God move in our lives over the last four months. We always make a joke that whenever the president announces, you know, uh, lockdown milestones, that those are the same milestones that we use for our wedding. Um, but I think throughout this time, we've seen God move uh, in terms of just how we work, um, in terms of just spending time with him. I feel like I'm, I'm spending more time with him now you know in terms of fellowshipping uh, because i don't have to stay in traffic um, i have more time in the mornings to read the word and to meditate on the word and to seek god not only for myself or for musa but just for work in general um, um you know just to 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 get wisdom and just to be at peace with um, the kind of work that i'm doing and just to 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 have you know client interactions that are that are meaningful and where I can add value to my work so that has helped it helped it has helped a lot um, in terms of my personal growth and my my job as well as my relationship with my wife and that's my story
Hi everybody, I'm Melody and welcome again to the Young Adults community. It's just so good to, you know, for us to have the space where we can share honestly, where we can connect with each other through our stories. Um, so really just thank you for joining us. We have just ended our Kingdom series and it was fantastic just explaining about what is the Kingdom of God, what does, what does Kingdom life mean, what do we mean when we say Kingdom? So if you haven't had the opportunity to check that out, please, please do, it was incredible. And um, today we're starting with a new series, just off the back of, of discussing all things kingdom. We want to know sort of where is our place in all of that? What, is, what does that mean for me individually? What does that mean for, for my story? And so this series is all about identity, purpose, and destiny. I think I'm not alone in saying that, uh, that in this stage of life, we're, we're often asking ourselves, what is my purpose? Why, why am I, and why am I doing what I'm doing? For who and to what end? And so we, we hope to answer some of those questions over the next couple of weeks and just open up the conversation of just really what our identity is, what our purpose is, and, and where our destiny lies. Um, so yeah, I'm kicking it off for us this week, and we're going to be reading from Matthew 16, verse 13 to 20. So if you could just open up to, to that portion of scripture. If you are new to, to reading the Bible, the book of Matthew is the first book in the New Testament, um, and uh, it's an account of the life of Jesus based on, on one of his disciples named Matthew. So yeah, we're going to be in Matthew 16 verse 13 to 20. I'm going to read through the passage and then we'll pray and, uh, and let's hear from God. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bound on, bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much that you speak to us at all times. And today, as you speak to us through the scripture, Father, I pray that we would have our, our ears open to what it is that you want to say to us, God, that you would speak into our hearts pertaining to destiny and purpose and identity, that you would show us who you are, Father God, and that we would see who we are, Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. So I've chosen this portion of scripture because, you know, I think it's a common one, but what I am choosing to focus on and what I, what I feel like God is revealing to us today is that understanding our identity is about, number one, understanding Christ, understanding God, and number two, believing then what Christ says about us. So, so this scripture is exactly all about that. There's an interaction with Jesus in which they speak about Jesus's identity and, and then Jesus flips it and speaks into Peter's identity. And so this is what we're aiming to do today. In verse 13, it says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, I want to pause there and, and just acknowledge that if you research a little bit about Caesarea Philippi, this is a place that was a no-go zone. Like, it was not okay to be there. There was just a lot of vile things happening there. You know, they would call it like a red light type of district. And so in this place, instead of worshipping God, the God of Israel, people were worshipping all sorts of idols. There would be perhaps, you know, uh, a little God that they deemed to be the God of fertility, perhaps another God who would help us with health, another God perhaps who would, you know, increase your wealth. And so they, they practiced idolatry. This is is what they this was just the order of the day this is what they believed in and uh I feel like you know I mean we could look upon these people of Caesarea Philippi and we could judge them but I think many times that's us that's our context that's the world that we live in that that there is a God 
a real God, a living God, but so many times we choose to, to worship other things. So many times we're chasing after other things, believing in other things as if they can do something for us, but they can't. Idolatry is, is it's, it's something that we, we don't like to associate ourselves with, but very easily do we slip into it. And, and the, the sad part about it is that it's, it's really just foolishness. Because it, it doesn't hold any promise. There's no eternal promise in idolatry. And the example I want to give you, it's like if God gave you a bunch of ingredients and you got to make this incredible stew, and then instead of worshiping the God who gave you the ingredients and who helped you to make the stew, instead you get down on your knees and you worship the stew and you say, yes, you are a God of, of provision and you're going to provide for the whole village. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense for us to worship things that have been created. Instead, we should worship the creator. And so already in this first verse, there's the invitation to lift up our eyes from, from what is around us and instead view God for who he is, our maker, our Lord, our creator. We move on to, to, to the next verse and, and, and it says here, who do people say that the son of man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And so in this part, Jesus is saying, okay, according to people in this, in this environment, who am I? According to people in this, in this space, who, you know, what, what's, what's word on the street? What are people saying about me? What are they saying? I, who are they saying I am? And I think that in our lives, very many times, we base our understanding of Jesus Christ on hearsay. We based our, our understanding of our, what our relationship with him should be like. We based that on other people's revelations or, or just things we've heard, perhaps articles we've read, maybe, maybe superstition, maybe things that your parents passed down onto you, meaning well, but perhaps it wasn't the truth. And I, I feel like in the scripture, there's this invitation to get to know God for who he really is instead of giving in to hearsay. I can see it happening. I can imagine in Caesarea Philippi, someone is coming along and saying, oh, there's a new guy in the town. Who is he? Oh, it's John the Baptist. And so, so then this person tells his sibling, hey, hey, John the Baptist is in town. And, and, and the next person goes on saying, hey, it's John the Baptist, you know, erroneously, a mistake based on hearsay. But it, it can become the third or fourth person's just absolute stance on truth. And that's what happens to us sometimes. And instead of, of getting to know Christ personally, we sometimes get to, 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 to know him through, through hearsay and what other people are saying. And in doing so, we miss his real identity. We miss out on who he truly is. Unperturbed by, by this error, Jesus moves on and he says, he said to them, but who do you say that I am? So, so Jesus doesn't defend himself. He doesn't defend himself against this identity issue. He knows who he is and he's secure in that. And he just says, okay, well, you who have been with me all this time, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replies, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. For modern Christians and for us perhaps going through the scripture today it doesn't seem strange that Peter would say something like this that you are the Christ you are the son of the living God but in that time and in this context to say that a man was the Christ that that indeed this person this person who is just a mere man this person who who comes you know not from not from any sort of wealth or privilege this man was born in a stable this is just a guy he he doesn't he's not adorned in the fanciest clothes he doesn't he's not rich even he doesn't he doesn't have a lot of stuff are you saying that this person is the messiah this is the one who's meant to save us all this is the one who you are deeming to be anointed to 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 create this you know opportunity for relationship between god and man you are saying that this person is the christ so for anyone around them, it would have been it would have been such a such an aha a moment, and it would have challenged everything within them. But Simon Peter, who has spent the past couple of months with Jesus, who has who has seen him, who has spoken to him, who has gotten to know his characters, decides, you know, at the end of all of everything that I've seen, 
I believe you. You are the Christ. It's interesting that um, that this is the conclusion he he draws because I think in most cases when we get to know people, um, in the beginning we think the best of them, and but then as we get to know them, we yeah I don't know that initial picture isn't isn't the same, and because we see they we see their 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 bad qualities, we see their faults, and and so we're not able to deem them as awesome anymore. But but Simon, after having spent all this time with God, is like you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. Living God being in in such contrast to to the time where people were were serving dead gods, idols. Jesus Jesus is, is proclaimed the son of the living God. And so here, Simon adequately describes Jesus's identity. He tells us who, who Jesus is. And this is when the, the most amazing moment, I think, in, in, in this portion of scripture happens. Jesus turns around and says, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. When Jesus calls Simon, Simon Bar-Jonah, he's saying Simon, Bar-Jonah means, you know, uh, son of Jonah. So he's saying, blessed are you, Simon, son of, son of Jonah, um, son of John, actually. But they've they've just sort of changed that um and so so blessed are you simon the son of john and and in identifying this jesus is saying simon i see you i see your story i know you i know you so well and in you having seen me as the lord and savior of your life i alone am able to speak into your identity and tell you who you are i see you simon Bartona. I've been there for every part of your life. I understand where you're coming from and I understand where you're going. Peter is coincidentally the same person who denied Jesus three times before his death. But still, Jesus says to him and relates to him, Simon Barjona, you are Peter. He declares this over him. Peter means rock. And Jesus says to him, he gives him an identity. He says, you are Peter, you are a rock. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There is such power in what Jesus speaks into Peter's life. He redefines him. He says, you are no longer to be called Simon from now onwards. I, your Lord, because you've chosen to accept me as your Lord, I define you and I speak into your into your identity. I speak into your purpose. I speak into your destiny that you are a rock and on this rock I shall build my church. Knowing everything about Peter's life, he says this. And I feel like this is where Jesus wants to relate to us in helping us understand our identity. He was there when you fell pregnant as a teenager and they told you that your life would come to nothing. He was there when they diagnosed you with a terminal illness, but you're still here now. He was there when they said you had a chronic illness and that you're never going to be able to achieve anything, you'll always be managing this illness. He was there when you lost your job and people around you said that because you've got no job now, you know, you're worth nothing when your friends left you. He was there. He was there when people placed immense pressure on you to be who they needed you to be in their lives. He was there all those times. He knows your story. He knows your life. He knows the mistakes you are even still yet to make and the situations that you are still to encounter. But those situations and those mistakes do not define you. Who defines you is himself, Jesus. What defines you is the words that he speaks over you. What defines you is being connected to Jesus. For some of us, we we know God, but we do not we do not know ourselves because we struggle to believe, or we struggle to hear what He's saying to us, and we struggle to to yeah to believe what it is that He's saying to us. I want to challenge us that instead of living a life of 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 acknowledging the things around us, that we would instead acknowledge Jesus Christ, understand that He is Lord and Savior, that He has the authority to speak into our lives, 
And because he's got that authority, we should trust everything that he says. Scripture tells us in 1 John 5 verse 12, Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Romans 8 verse 16 says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we also be glorified with him. Herein we we find our definition that when we accept Jesus, we become children of God. And it ends there. You're a child of God. You get to receive every blessing that children of God get to receive. You get to, to walk in the glory that God has set out for you. You get to partake of the blessing that God wants to give you if you surrender your life to Jesus and if you choose him and if you choose to understand him and you choose to know him. This is the identity that he offers us. Your identity is not in your job. It is not in your family. It is not in, 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 in being a, a, a wonderful spouse. It is not in being a fantastic mother. That is not where in your identity is found. Your identity is not in the car that you drive, the house that you own, the wealth that you acquire. It is not in that. Your identity can only be found in Christ. And so I want to encourage two types of people today. One, if you... If you know God, you've been walking with him, but you just, you just haven't been able to believe who he says that you are. It hasn't been enough to understand that your identity is in him and that you are a daughter or a son of God. If, you, if, if you're realizing for the first time that, that actually this is wherein, you're fi- wherein you find your identity, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. And the other group of people that I'd like to pray for is those who who would like to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior so that they could find out who it is that they really are, so that they could embark on on the most incredible journey of, of living a life of glory with God. Maybe you're hearing all that I'm saying and you, you're sick and tired of the pressure of, of identity defined by society. You want to be defined by God. You want to accept him into your life. If that's you if, you, if you're part of either of those two groups, I'd love for you to pray this prayer with me. Father God, thank you that you are Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord, that it is you and you alone who are worthy to be praised. Lord God, I recognize that on my own, I'm not enough and this world is not enough. So, Lord, I surrender all that I thought before coming to know you today and coming of this knowledge today. I surrender all that. I set it aside. I surrender myself and I accept you into my life as Lord and Savior. And I choose to believe, God, in who it is that you declare that I am. I choose to believe in your word. I choose to believe in your will. And I choose to believe in your way. In Jesus' name, amen. If you're part of either of those two groups and and you just like some some further ministry, we'd so, so love to connect with you. We've got a Zoom session happening after this. And so, you know, uh, please join us for that. It's it's just going to be such a great opportunity to get to to meet with with you who have responded. My challenge today um, is just for us to get to know God and, and to believe that in getting to know him, we get to know who we are. And as we establish our identity, we find our purpose and we reach our destiny. Believe in who God says you are. Amen. Thank you so much for that affirming word, Melody. May we truly believe what God says we are. Feel free to join us right now for a short 15-minute Zoom call uh, where we pray, we interact, and we encourage each other. If you're watching on YouTube, the link will be under the video. And if you're watching through our online service, it's right there in the comments. Be blessed and take care.